I like to check out the uh, average age of my audience when I speak so I know what to share. How many of you remember the Art Link Letter Show? Quite a few. I remember coming home from school and I sit in front of that black and white TV and I would watch Art Link Letter every single day before I even did homework. And the title of his program was Kids Say the Darnest Things. Now, I have a granddaughter, just turned nine. She'll come over and we'll pick out on some of her favorite food, peanut butter and crackers. And I would show her some of the photographs that, I, uh, that I've taken during my travels. I was in Goldsboro, I was in Shelby, I was up in West Virginia. And this past week, we was looking at all of these photographs and boy, she just looking all through them and just asking questions. And I told her I was coming here Sunday. And she's looking at all these photographs and she's, I say, what do you think, sweetheart? She's looking and she said, huh, are you going to look like a fly in a bowl of milk? Some of you will get that when you're having lunch. <laughs> Every morning, afternoon and evening, I'm quite sure, you watch the news and what dominates the news? The Iranians. I want you to know their brothers and sisters in that country from a church like this who need your prayer support because they're doing the work of their church. They're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in spite of everything that's going on. Over 2,000 men and women. Since 1989, they have distributed over 48 million copies of the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, everybody who get a copy is not going to read the book. But God says, my word will not return unto me, boy. Maybe the ones receive it didn't get it, but maybe they laid it on the table. Somebody came by and they read that book. So I praise the Lord for your support. The last time the Gideons went to the White House, that was to present the President of the United States with a three billion copy of the Word of God. Again, thanks for your prayers and financial support. But before they left the White House, presidents say, we need to pray. And for 45 minutes, they prayed for our country. We need more prayers for our country. So I ask that you just don't pray generally. Get specific. Pray for our government. Pray for our leaders. I want to thank you for your continued prayer support the Gideons International. Last year, over 90 million copies of the Word of God was placed around the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I wanted, when I got these numbers, I wanted to reduce them to the smallest common denominator. So what I did, I got me two sharp number two pencils, a legal pad, fixed me a tall cup of coffee, and I went out on the patio and I started crunching numbers. My little nine-year-old granddaughter, she came out and said, what are you doing, Papa? 
And I explained to her what I was trying to do. She pulled this little gadget out of her pocket and she, and she gave me the results. I say, man, that thing is neat. What do you call that? She said, a calculator. <laughs> 2.5 scriptures every second of the day. While you're sitting here right now, each time your heart beats, a scripture is being placed someplace in the world. And that is because of your prayers and your financial support. So I say thank you. Thank you for your support. A lot of you travel. Matter of fact, I was talking to a lady this morning. She was telling me about her travels to India. You can go to Israel. You can go to China. You can go to Jerusalem, Italy. And you don't even have to leave this country. You go to New York City. You will get the full flavor of all of those countries in New York City. Every year, Gideons across the country and their wives, they donate their time and they go to New York City, what we call a Bible blitz. Now, my brother Lord Crum, he's from Georgia, and he's, he owned two shrimp boats. But I tell you what, come September, boy, he'd lead those shrimp boats, and he'd go to New York City, and he'd take care of coordinating all of the Bibles. And when we get ready to go out, he'd coordinate those Bibles. We'd go out on the streets. The ladies go out to nursing homes. They go to different places, and they give copies of the Word of God to everybody. We want to make sure that every person that we come in contact with get a copy of the Word of God. We don't preach. We don't force. We just say, would you like to have a copy of the Word of God? And usually when I give out a copy, I say, read the back page first. You know what's on the back page? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want to make sure that's the first thing that they read. From that point on, they can read the plan of salvation. Now, what I enjoy about going to New York City is talking to the first responders. I go to those, all of those different uh, facilities, and, 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 and I just love listening to the testimonies of 9-11, listening to the things that they experienced during 9-11. But your support to Gideons was there because they made sure even during terrible times, those men, those women, they got a copy of the Word of God. So I, again, I say thank you for your support. New York City, <laughs> school, schools is not built like they are here. They got plenty of ground. They got big playground up there, New York City. Everything is built high. <laughs> so school may be seven, eight stories tall. School teachers, want, she wanted Bibles for her, 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 her students, and, and she couldn't come down, so she used a bucket, told her, get in, fill it up. And she did it several times, fill it up. And she made sure her students got a copy of the Word of God. Now, I was standing by the subway by Hunter University, and passing out scriptures to the students. And as I was standing there passing out student, uh, 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 testament as the students got off the sub going to school, there was a young lady that walked up to me. She had a big smile on her face. And boy, she just walked up to me and she gave me a big hug. Now I'm in New York City. Pretty young lady walk up to me, even with a face like mine. Started hugging me, made me feel a little uncomfortable. 
I pushed her back and I said, what's wrong? And she said, mister, in 1989, the Gideons was here. And they gave my grandmother a copy of the Word of God. And every night she would read to me from this book. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I tell you, I was blessed. I said, you give me that and here, I'm going to give you a new one. She said, I take a new one, but you ain't getting this. <laughs> my assignment when I was in New York City was to go to Rikers Island. Now, I don't know if any of you guys watch Law and Order, but that's all Jack McCord talks about was Rikers. You go to Rikers, you get off that boat, there's a sign that says, Home of New York Boldness. And let me tell you, they're young, they're nice looking, but I tell you, they're bold. They're bold in their speech and in their action. When I went to Rikers, it was a big group gathered in the uh, fellowship hall. A couple of the inmates got a little rowdy. You guys come over here and you want to give us a copy of the Bible. You want to tell us how to live. But you don't know what it's like in the real world. You don't know what it's like being in the streets exposed to drugs, being raised in an abusive home. And I quieted the crowd down because they was getting a little rowdy. I said, hey, guys, hey, let me share a personal story with you. Everybody looked at me, and I tell you, I shared a personal story with them, but I'm not, I'm going to share with you, but I'm not going to do it in the same language that I did with them. But I took them back to a time when I was sitting on a park bench in Battle Creek, Michigan, recapping my life, thinking about all the things that happened. You see, I grew up in a home that sold bootleg whiskey. My mother was an alcoholic, my father was an alcoholic, my sister was suicidal, and my brother died from a crippling disease at a very early age. At the age of 13, I witnessed a stabbing death of my father. And it was that experience that caused me to harden my heart against the world. I got involved with drugs, alcohol, and prostitution. But during that time, I knew something was missing. I didn't know what it was, but there was a man in my neighborhood by the name of Charlie Karowski. Charlie owned a butcher shop, and he gave me a job in his butcher shop in an effort to keep me out of trouble. Well, I tell you, Charlie became like a father figure to me. I would go over to his house on weekends. I would help him wash cars and cut the grass, and that was an experience that I had never had before. But our relationship fell apart when he caught me dealing drugs across the counter to his customers. There I was, broken relationship with my father figure. Well, I thought, well, maybe if I joined the military, I could travel, I could see the world. Maybe that would be the solution. Well, I joined the Army. Within eight weeks, I had went AWOL twice because of my drug problems. And Uncle Sam concluded, Kennedy, you are useless, you're no good, and we are not going to waste our time trying to make a soldier out of you. Here I was, a reject in Uncle Sam's army during a time when they were sending any and everybody to Vietnam. Well, when I got out, I started working in a slaughterhouse in Philadelphia. Had a friend, his name was Joe. Joe would always try to convince me. He'd say, Lee, you need to change your lifestyle. You need to change your group of friends. I, I didn't listen to Joe. Of course, Joe Frazier went on to be the heavyweight champ of the world. Leroy Kennedy continued his life of drugs, alcohol. 
But I tell you, got married. We had three boys. During our first six years of marriage, it was nothing but hills and valleys because of my drugs and alcohol. I decided I'm going to straighten up and do right. Wasn't going to church, but I'm going to straighten up and do right. Worked hard that year, saved our money to give our kids a big Christmas. A few weeks before Christmas, I went to the bank and I withdrew all of my children's Christmas funds. I went to a drug house, started gambling. The place got raided and I ended up in jail. I went to a drug house, started gambling, place got raided. Then when I got in jail, I called my, my wife to explain to her what had ha happened. A few hours later, she sent her attorney down to get me out of jail, but the condition of my release was for me to sign my divorce papers, deed my portion of the house over to her, and leave the city of Philadelphia. That was another dark moment in my life. After I was released from jail, I went to the airport with only a few dollars in my pocket. I laid it on the airport and said, I want the first plane going anywhere leaving Philadelphia. I shook the dust off my shoes and I said, I am never coming back to this city. Well, I tell you what, first plane that was leaving was going to Detroit. I ended up in a homeless shelter. No job, no home, no friends. But during my time in that homeless shelter, I met a lady who was doing volunteer counseling work. We developed a relationship and we got married. One kid, 18 months later, she concluded, Leroy Kennedy, you're useless and I want you out of my life. At the age of 30, I was on my third marriage still searching for something to fill that void in my life. My wife had came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and she would tell me how Jesus could change my life. I told her nobody could change me. She said, but Jesus can change your life. She began to have a Bible study in our home, and when she did, her Christian friends would come over on a Tuesday and a Wednesday evening, and I did not like those Christians coming into my house. I called my drug friends over. I called my alcoholic friends over. And on the night that they was having prayer meeting and Bible study, we would be in the other room smoking dope, tooting coke, telling dirty jokes. I was determined to run those Christians out of my house. My wife, she said, I can't continue to live like this. Either you change or I'm leaving. I told her I couldn't change. I didn't know how. She said, but Jesus can change your life. A few weeks went by. She noticed that I was not making any effort to change my way of living. She packed up everything that she had and she moved back to southern Illinois. That following morning after she left, I got up early, rolled me a joint, tooted some coke, took me a couple of hits of blotted acid, and I want you to know I was stoned out of my mind. I went for a walk in the county park up in Battle Creek, Michigan, where we was living. And as I was walking through that park, found this park bench, and I was just sitting on that park bench, recapping my life, thinking about all the things people had said about me. You're useless. You're no good. You will never amount to nothing. It was that day I came to the conclusion that I would be better off to the world if I was dead. And I was going home that morning to start popping pills to commit suicide. But as I was walking through the park, there were some faithful men from a church like this 
they was witnessing to the homeless and they was giving them these little testaments. And one of those men, he had a handful of these little testaments. He had a Bible tucked under his arms. And he walked up to me, he had a big smile on his face, and he said, do you know Jesus? I said, no, and I don't want to know Jesus. He said, Jesus loves you. I say, man, if you knew of all the people whom I've hurt, if you knew of all the things that I have did wrong, nobody, absolutely nobody could love me. And I didn't want to hear any more about this Jesus. I pushed him aside, and when I did, that Bible he was carrying fell to the ground. And I was compelled to pick up that Bible. And when I picked it up, my eyes was glued to the page of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says, come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good from the land. I'm telling you, church, those words did surgery on my soul. I fell to my knees. I began to cry. That man picked up one of those little testaments, and he showed me, for God so loved the world that he gave his son for Leroy Kennedy. And it was that day I prayed. And I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart, clean up my life, and make me somebody. The Lord heard that prayer, and the Lord answered that prayer. And I want you to know I was 100% clear-headed for my drugs. I never had anything to bring me down off of an acid trip. But when I said, Jesus, I said, yes, come into my heart and clean up my life. I was clear-headed. I was so excited. I went home, got on the phone. I called my wife, and I shared with her about my life-changing experience. She said, I know there's something different about you because we've been talking for 45 minutes and you have not said one bad word. The Lord had even taught me how to speak English. My wife and I, we got back together. We joined the local church. Doctors had told my wife she would never be able to bear children. But you know, what's impossible for man is not impossible for God. The Lord began to bless us with one, two, three, four. My prayer life got very strong. Lord, no more. <laughs> well, I tell you, <laughs> my pastor got my wife and I involved in the children ministry. Me involved with the jail ministry, the men's ministry. And he even got me involved, Ross and I involved, with the Gideons. Because that's the only way you can become a member of the Gideons International. You must be recommended by your pastor. And I tell you what, Ross is serving the Gideons to this day down in Florida. And here I am. A nobody sharing this brief story with you. Well, I tell you, things was happening in my life so fast. My wife and I, we was growing spiritually. And after 10 years of marriage and being involved with all the different ministry, I came home from work. My wife had been sick. I took her to the doctor. Tests revealed she had cancer. Nine months later, she died. But during those nine months leading up to her death, 
my Christian friends would come over and they would pray with us. And when they would leave, they would always give me the Christian favorite scripture during times of troubles. Romans 8.28. How all things work together for good for those that love him in a call according to his purpose. I'm going to tell you, church, during those nine months, I had had Romans 8.28 up to here. I was sick of Romans 8.28 because I could not understand the reality of Romans 8.28. A few weeks later, I was collecting my wife's personal things, and I picked up her Bible, and a three-page letter fell out of it. Two of those pages was written to each one of my children in the day that she prayed and led each one of them to the Lord. Third page was written to me. You know how she started her letter? Romans 8.28. Here is a woman that knew almost to the day when she was going to be leaving this world and she can quote Romans 8.28. I'm going to tell you that scripture became the foundation for my life every single day, regardless of what I, I'm going through. Well, I tell you, things begin to happen in our life. Things begin to happen with my children and I. We joined a missionary group, went to India. My children, they, the puppet ministry was something that they was good at. And we would go into the villages of India and Sri Lanka and we would share the gospel. They would set up their pu puppet stage. We would share the gospel. I'm going to tell you, new churches was being birthed. People was coming to know Christ like never before. Then we went down to Sri Lanka. I tell you, Sri Lanka is not a friendly country to missionaries. I, uh, working down there in a village and military police, they came to the village where we was working and they say, we are revoking your visa. You're required to leave the country immediately. They escorted us to the airport and they put us out of the country. We couldn't go home to get our personal things. We couldn't go home to get our family. And let me tell you, my four children was in Sri Lanka for six months. I prayed every day. I couldn't do anything. I called the American Embassy, but I couldn't do a thing. But the Lord said, all things work together for good for those that love him and a call according to his purpose. We made front page of post-dispatch. And I'm going to tell you, only the Lord worked out. I'm reminded of a scripture in Jeremiah 32, 17. Our Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. Nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible for you tell you, I got my children back, came back to this country. And I tell you, <laughs> there's a lot more to my story. You just got to read the book. <laughs> I just don't have time to share. But I want you to know, because of your support, your financial support, your prayer support, the Lord changes lives. After I shared my testimony with those inmates, we had a move of God in, in that place at Rikers Island that I had never experienced before. Inmates was crying, they was embracing, they was on, the, they, they was on their knees praying. Hallelujah. All because one testament in the hands of one person asking the question, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted him? as your Lord and Savior. So church, when my first wife 
had me sign my divorce papers, deed my portion of the house over to her. I swore I was never going back to Philadelphia to live or to work. But you know, God has his plan. We have plans in our heart. Lord, his purpose. And he direct our steps. I finished a 25-year career with Walmart in charge of all of the Philadelphia stores. <laughs> that was God's plan. It wasn't mine. So, here I am, a nobody from the streets of Philly, all because of your prayers and financial support. And I want to encourage you to continue to support the Gideons because one little testament in the hands of one person could make a difference, but we can't do it without your prayers. And maybe there's some of you here right today who say, I'd like to be a member of the Gideons International and represent my church when I walk out that door. Well, I'm going to tell you, all you do, you talk with pastor or with a local Gideon. can make that happen. So, here I am, a nobody from the streets of Philly, a washed up drug addict reject. But God took a nobody, made me a somebody, so I can tell everybody that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I want to say thank you for your support and ask that you will continue support of the Gideons International. God bless you as you send us out once again. Thank you.